In this series, we'll be looking at specific cards from Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and detailing what was great about them, why they might have stopped seeing play, and everything else in between. To start this off, we'll be going over one of my favorite boss monsters, Obelisk the Tormentor. Obelisk the Tormentor is a level 10 Divine Beast type monster, and simply has the effect that you must provide three tributes for its tribute summon. Your opponent can't negate its summon, it can't be targeted by card effects from both players, once per turn, it can give up its battle and tribute two monsters in order to destroy all of your opponent's monsters, and if this card is special summoned, it's sent to the graveyard during the end phase. This card is part of a series of monsters known as the God Cards, because in the original Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, they just gave them a whole bunch of effects, and each one was basically a boss monster of a card, in like the video game sense. But because of all of its effects, it couldn't possibly be released in the actual game with all of the weird rules and limitations as it seems like they just made up new effects every time they brought the cards out. And of the three original god cards which were released, only Obelisk the Tormentor saw any kind of competitive play at first. Nowadays, the only god card which sees competitive play is the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode, which is technically just one of the versions of the Winged Dragon of Raw and not the original card itself. In the anime, the effects of Obelisk the Tormentor were as follows. First off, it also required three tributes for its normal summon. Secondly, it also had a couple of additional protection effects, where it could not be tributed by your opponent, control of the card could not swap to your opponent, it also had some weird protections from spells, traps, and monster effects, where basically, it was immune to most traps, except for the ones that altered its attack and defense and prevented it from attacking, but it was only affected by those cards for one turn. It was affected by spell cards, except for ones that would remove it from the field, it was also unaffected by monster effects, except for the monster effects of other god cards, which would only work on it for one turn, with the exception of the Winged Dragon of Ra, whose effect would work on it normally. Obelisk was also treated as a warrior-type monster. It could not be equipped with cards. If special summoned, it would return to the place it was special summoned from during the end phase. If it was in defense position, your opponent could only target this card for attacks and effects, similar to Haman Lord of Striking Thunder. During your main phase, you can tribute two monsters to destroy all of your opponent's monsters, and then immediately attack directly, but then it can't attack during the battle phase that turn. And also, during the battle phase, you can instead tribute two monsters to make this card's attack become infinity for one attack only. So, all in all, its anime counterpart had around 10 effects, which is still way less than the Winged Dragon of Raw, which clocked in at around 20 effects. And you can see, with all of the weird rules and limitations on its anime effects, that they couldn't really directly import that to the real game. So in order to try to have a more balanced version of its anime counterpart, it kept some of its protection in the form of full target immunity, and since this is one of the target immune cards which also prevents the owner of the card from targeting it, it also kept its little distinction where you can't equip it with cards, since you need to be able to target your own cards in order to equip it with one. It also kept its ability to tribute two cards to destroy all of your opponent's monsters, but they didn't allow it to attack immediately afterwards, nor did it let it keep its infinite attack effect during the battle phase. And they even kind of gave it the effect where it returns to the place it was special summoned to at the end of the turn, except in this case it just goes to the graveyard because that's a lot less of a rules nightmare. And of the three original god cards, Obelisk was the only one who was given target immunity, and it was the only one with a high baseline attack of 4000. So, of the three, Obelisk was easily the most useful, since a Slifer had its attack based on how many cards are in your hand, and didn't have any form of protection on the field, and the Winged Dragon of Ra was even worse. It had the restriction where it could not be special summoned at all. Its attack was entirely dependent on paying all of your life points, and also had no form of protection once it hit the field either. The only form of protection these three cards shared was how your opponent can't negate its summon or activate any cards on their summon. So, they were safe from stuff like Bottomless Trap Hole, for example, but vulnerable to everything else. Although, getting three monsters in the field for a normal summon, for just a target immune 4000 attack beater, isn't what you'd call a very good strategy in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! And it wasn't super good back in the day when they did finally release the card. But despite that, it did still see some competitive play. Excuse me, sir? I'm here for the meeting for boss monsters. Yeah, sorry, you're not on the list. Um, perhaps there's a mistake? It's Obelisk the Torbenter? Yeah, never heard of ya. You. you didn't even... You didn't even look at your list. Nope, sorry. 
can't find it. Hey, Levian here. Welcome back. Good to see ya. Yeah, sir, if you could move along, that'd be great. The year was 2010. A new wave of frog support had been released, culminating with Ronin Toten being added in the middle of 2010, which gave them access to the Frog Tribute Engine Trio. Substitoad, Swap Frog, and of course Ronin Toten all allowed frog decks to pull out a near infinite amount of tribute fodder. And since Obelisk the Tormentor was released at the beginning of 2010, it seemed like a no-brainer that Obelisk would be played alongside Monarch support and frogs. So a 2010 Frog Monarch deck would run excellent tribute summon cards like Caius the Shadow Monarch, Light and Darkness Dragon, and of course a single copy of Obelisk the Tormentor which was a perfect deck that countered a lot of the meta, where the main form of removal at the time was targeting, with cards like Gladiator Beast Geyserus, or just staple trap cards at the time, like Solemn Judgment, Compulsory Evacuation Device, or Bottomless Trap Hole, none of which could stop Obelisk. However, even with all of these things, it was still only a one-of, and it immediately stopped seeing play once Substitute was banned, and that wasn't even the most efficient use of Substitute. It still pretty much only saw niche playing frog decks until 2013. That's when Obelisk hit its peak of popularity, thanks to one certain archetype, which is famous for being one of the strongest archetypes in the game while never actually hitting the status of tier 0. And that of course is the Dragon Rulers. The Dragon Rulers were a series of four monsters, each one representative of one of the attributes in the game except light and dark and all four of them basically had the same three effects, where each Dragon Ruler could special summon themselves from the Hand or Graveyard by banishing two monsters from the Hand or Graveyard, which either shared the same attribute as that specific Dragon Ruler, or was simply just Dragon type. Their second effect was if said Dragon Ruler was banished, you got to add a Dragon type monster from your deck to your hand that shared the same attribute as that Dragon Ruler. And lastly, each one had a different and unique hand effect, where you could send it and another monster of its attribute from your hand to the graveyard in order to either destroy one card in the field, special summon one monster from the graveyard, send a monster from the deck to the graveyard, or add any dragon monster from your deck to your hand. And they all shared the same restrictions, where they all shared a hard once per turn between all three of their effects, and if they special summon themselves, they'd return to your hand at the end of your opponent's turn. So, what made the Dragon Rulers so good was the fact that they were a recursion machine. All four of the Dragon Rulers could bring themselves out very easily, and you could use the Dragon Rulers to bring out another Dragon Ruler as a material, in order to activate the effects of the other Dragon Rulers to search out more cards. In addition to the fact that the hand effects of the Dragon Rulers were all good. So, how did Obelisk fit into this deck? Well, for one, since the Dragon Rulers had four cards that could special summon themselves from the graveyard, getting the required three monsters in the field for a tribute summon of an Obelisk was not overly difficult. And for two, since Dragon Rulers were so popular, pretty much everyone was playing Dragon Rulers, and mirror match Dragon Ruler decks didn't really have an out to Obelisk. The two most popular extra deck monsters that Dragon Rulers went into were Mecha Phantom Beast Draco Sack and Number 11 Big Eye, both of which need to target a monster in order to remove them, and they just didn't have monsters that could easily boost their attack over 4000 to destroy Obelisk by battle. The only common out you could go into in a Dragon Ruler deck was basically just using Black Rose Dragon to destroy the field. And because Dragon Rulers could provide the tributes for Obelisk very easily, by either just special summoning through Dragon Rulers, or more realistically, going into Mecha Phantom Beast Draco Sack and using it to provide three tributes, Obelisk was the perfectly vile option to bring out, and was incredibly difficult for other Dragon Ruler decks to do anything about it. But Spellbook decks could deal with it no problem, as Spellbook of Fate was non-targeting banishing removal. And other kinds of decks had outs to it as well, so Obelisk was mostly purely a side deck option, very rarely played in the main deck. And even then, it was mostly played as a one-off in the side deck. Sometimes two copies, but rarely three. Which is kind of surprising for a card that's basically meant to win a mirror match. Then, after all the Dragon Ruler cards were limited to one copy, Obelisk just kind of stopped seeing play and was no longer included in their side decks. Although it's not because the Dragon Rulers were restricted and limited to one, it was actually because at the same time, a new generic rank 4 Xyz monster called Evil Swarm Excited Knight was released, which gave pretty much every deck an easy out to Obelisk, with its ability to destroy everything on the field as long as you controlled less cards on your opponent, and could get two level 4 monsters on the field. Hey guys, what's up? Long time no see. Um... 
What the heck are you doing here? I'm just here to catch up with some of my old buddies, that's all. You guys see Substitute around here? Yeah, he hangs out with Mass Driver all the time. But what are you doing here? You don't belong in the Forbidden Realm. And how did you even find this place? Oh, I had Tempest give me directions. He's out on parole. Come on, guys. You remember me, right? We used to be best friends, teammates, chum buds. You were like a niche addition to our decks. I wouldn't say we were that close. Despite Obelisk not really seeing any competitive play since 2014, it remained a pretty popular card in the more casual scene, alongside pretty much all archetypes from the original Duelist Kingdom arc. Although despite its popularity, it didn't really receive any support until 2020 in the OCG, with the release of a new card called Fist of Fate. This is a quick play spell card, which can only be activated if you control a monster whose original name is Obelisk the Tormentor, which basically allows you to negate the effects of a monster your opponent controls, and then just like super negate and destroy that card, where the effects of its name, its mom's name, anything related to that card just no longer works until the end of the turn. Also, it's spell speed 4, so your opponent can't respond to it, and if you use this during your main phase, you also get to destroy all of your opponent's spell and trap cards. So a very thematic super destruction effect, which is nowhere near good enough to allow Obelisk the Tormentor to continue seeing play in the modern era. It is pretty in line with cards that require a specific name monster in the field in order to be activated, though. Generally, those effects have to be super strong because of how limiting they are. In 2014, it also did get some blanket support with Ra's Disciple, which is a level 4 monster that allows you to special summon two other copies of it from your hand or deck when this card is summoned, but with the restriction that they can basically only be used as tribute fodder for the three god cards, including Obelisk. And also, you cannot special summon monsters while it's on the field, except other copies of itself. And because of this lockdown on yourself from special summoning, this card actually saw competitive play in Duel Links when it was released as a card to give to your opponent in order to stop them from being able to special summon monsters, which eventually got cards like Give and Take limited on their ban list, as it allows you to special summon Ra's Disciple from your graveyard directly to your opponent's side of the field. And now, it's time for unconventional combos with Obelisk. Did you know, according to Yugipedia, if you have some good insect type monsters in your graveyard, the trap card, Spider Egg, can protect both yourself from an attack and special summon three spider tokens, which can then be used to summon Obelisk on your next turn. Also, if you combine Obelisk with either March of the Monarchs or Mound of the Bound Creator, you can give yourself a virtually indestructible obelisk. And this concludes Unconventional Combos with Obelisk from the Yugipedia Tips and Tricks section. Now, I'm sure everyone is probably wondering, but what exactly is an obelisk? Well, it's the thing you're looking at that I got from the stock image website. Although, to be more specific, it's a type of religious monument from ancient Egypt, which can refer to any number of things, but the important thing is that it was based on ancient Egypt aesthetic. A lot of early Yu-Gi-Oh cards were based around ancient Egypt type things, unlike modern Yu-Gi-Oh where most new cards are based on anime waifus. Seeing as the Egyptian gods were so popular in the original Yu-Gi-Oh anime, there have been a number of retrains of Obelisk over the years. One of them being the Wicked God counterpart called the Wicked Dreadroot. This is a 4,000 attack monster which requires three tributes for its normal summon and cannot be special summoned at all and its only effect on the field is to have the attack and defense of all other monsters. Which means the Wicked Dreadroot can beat over the original Obelisk in a fight, since its ability to have all attacks on the field doesn't target. It also has a Sacred Beast counterpart called Raviel, Lord of Phantasms, which looks almost exactly like the original Obelisk, and it has the effect where it cannot be normal summoned and can only be special summoned from your hand by tributing three Fiend-type monsters you control. And then has the effects where each time your opponent normal summons a monster, you get to special summon a token with a thousand attack and defense. Once per turn, this card can tribute a monster to gain that monster's attack until the end of the turn. So, it is nice that the card can special summon itself from the hand with its tributes, rather than requiring your normal summon, but requiring those three monsters on the field to be fiend type is what kind of kills this card, in addition to its pretty lackluster effects. Although, they did release a retrain of this card, called Raviel, Lord of Phantasms, a Shimmering Scraper, which can special summon itself from the hand by tributing any three monsters. Although I will note, the other Sacred Beast card called Haman, Lord of Striking Thunder, 
which is based on the Winged Dragon of Ra, actually has an effect that's very similar to one of Obelisk's anime effects. That while Haman's in defense position, your opponent can only target this card for attacks. And with 4,000 defense, that's not half bad. Now, as a fun little thought experiment, how could we fix Obelisk to make it compete in the modern era? If we were to alter the effects of Obelisk the Tormentor so that it would actually see play, and to fit the theme of the original card, here's what I would do. Just like, make it immune to card effects. Just straight up, ultimate falcon that card. In the original anime, part of what made the god cards so worth the effort to bring out was how hard they were to get rid of once they hit the field. And the only reason Obelisk saw play was because of its targeted immunity on a 4,000 attack beat stick. The fact that it can also destroy your opponent's cards was just a bonus, but not the main reason the card was played. So if they simply changed its targeted immunity to just everything immunity, I think that would go a really long way to the card actually seeing play. In fact, it might go too far and may get a little bit overpowered in some unforeseen circumstance. Generally, the ability to become immune to all card effects is heavily regulated. Part of the reason Masterpiece the True Draco Slain King is banned is because of its ability to become immune to two-thirds of the cards in the game, on top of its spell speed 2 disruption. You don't have to change anything else about Obelisk except what it's immune to, and that might be enough to kind of break the card. Alternatively, if you don't want to make it hard to destroy, they did release a new card made specifically for Obelisk, so if they just gave that card's effect to Obelisk, I think that would also help too. Give it a spell speed 4 monster negation effect, which can also destroy your opponent's back row if used during your turn. In this alternative case, it would have all of its other same effects, just this one added on top of it. Although, in order for it to fit in the card text, we could just remove its ability to tribute two monsters to destroy all of your opponent's monsters in order to give it this quick effect. In that case, it would still be a target immune monster with a really good negate, which would be worth building the required tributes to bring it out. And one advantage tribute summon monsters have over special summoned ones is the ability to play floodgates with them, like the monarchs erupt. Although, just to stress this again, only a fun thought experiment. I'm not saying they should change the card to make it more competitive, that doesn't really make any sense, but I do think playing with how you could fix the card to make it more competitive does a good job of highlighting why the card doesn't currently see play. Non-targeting destruction effects are very prevalent, so even a halfway competent meta deck can out Obelisk pretty easily. Which is a problem based on how many cards are required to actually bring the card out properly. However, if they were to release a clone retrain like they did with Raviel, Lord of Phantasm's Shimmering Scraper, then that could be a good way to give it better effects. And therein concludes the first episode of The Card Logs, covering Obelisk the Tormentor. Now, seeing as this is the first episode of a new series, I'm very open to suggestions and feedback in order to make it better, and also ideas for future topics. Once this video goes live, I'll have a community poll up on my YouTube in order to pick the next topic of the series. So make sure you check that out if you're watching this within the first couple of days that it was uploaded. If not, seeing as it's a new series, I would be very appreciative if literally everyone watching liked the video. That way, YouTube can suggest it to as many people as possible.